Chapter 5, The Incident of the Letter. It was late in the afternoon when Mr. Utterson found his way to Dr. Jekyll's door, where he was at once admitted by Poole and carried down by the kitchen offices and across a yard which had once been a garden to a building which was indifferently known as the laboratory or the dissecting rooms. The doctor had bought the house from the heirs of a celebrated surgeon and his own tastes, being rather chemical than anatomical, had changed the destination of the block at the bottom of the garden. It was the first time that the lawyer had been received into that part of his friend's quarters, and he eyed the dingy, windowless structure with curiosity and gazed around with a distasteful sense of strangeness as he crossed the theater once crowded with eager students and now lying gaunt and silent, the tables laden with chemical apparatus, the floor strewn with crates and littered with packing straw, and the light falling dimly through the foggy cupola. At the further end, a flight of stairs mounted to a door covered with red baize. And through this, Mr. Utterson was at last received into the doctor's cabinet. Cabinet is his apartment, okay, where he resided. It was like a, a, a really posh office in a school building. It would be like the principal's office um, because this laboratory was once a school. He used to teach students, if you noticed, but the students no longer come there. So he was received in to the doctor's cabinet. It was a large room, fitted round with glass presses, furnished among other things with a cheval glass and a business table, and looking out upon the court by three dusty windows barred with iron. Sounds like a spooky place to me. A fire burned in the grate, a lamp was set lighted on a chimney shelf, for even in the houses, the fog began to lie quick, thickly. And there, close up to the warmth, sat Dr. Jekyll, looking deadly sick. He did not rise to meet his visitor, but held out a cold hand and bade him welcome in a changed voice. And now, said Mr. Utterson, as soon as Poole had left them, you've heard the news? The doctor shuddered. They were crying it in the square, he said. I heard them in my dining room. They're talking about, he heard the news of the murder of Sir Danvers Carew. The doctor shuddered. They were crying in the square. They heard them in my dining room. One word, said the lawyer. Carew was my client, but so are you, and I want to know what I'm doing. You have not been mad enough to hide this fellow. Now remember, the word mad does not mean angry here. In the 1800s, when they said mad, what they mean is crazy. Okay? Crazy. So, he's saying... Are you crazy enough to hide this murderer from the police? Because he suspects, you know, that maybe Dr. Jekyll does apparently like Mr. Hyde, and maybe he would try to keep Hyde hidden to keep him from getting into, you know, into trouble, to keep him from getting arrested for the murder. Possible. That's what Utterson thinks. Utterson, I swear to God, cried the doctor, I swear to God I will never set eyes on him again. I bind my honor to you that I am done with him in this world. It is all at an end. And indeed, he does not want my help. You do not know him as I do. He is safe. He is quite safe, mark my words. He will never more be heard of. The lawyer listened gloomily. He did not like his friend's feverish manner. You seem pretty sure of him, said he. And for your sake, I hope you may be right. If it came to a trial, your name might appear. Oh, I'm quite sure of him, replied Jekyll. 
I have grounds for certainty that I cannot share with anyone. Hmm. But there's one thing on which you may advise me. I have, I have received a letter, and I'm not at a loss whether I should show it to the police. I should like to leave it in your hands, Utterson. You would judge wisely, I'm sure. I have so great a trust in you. You fear, I suppose, that it might lead to his detention? Asked the lawyer. No, said the other. I cannot say that I care what becomes of Hyde. I'm quite done with him. I was thinking of my own character, which this hateful business has rather exposed. Utterson ruminated a while. He was surprised at his friend's selfishness, and yet relieved by it. Well, said he at last, let me see the letter. The letter was written in an odd, upright hand and signed Edward Hyde. And it signified, briefly enough, that the writer's benefactor, Dr. Jekyll, whom he had so long unworthily repaid for a thousand generosities, need labor under no alarm for his safety, as he has means of escape on which he placed a sure dependence. The lawyer liked this letter well enough. It put a better color on the intimacy that he had looked for, and he blamed himself for some of his past suspicions. So make sure you, you take note of what this letter is about, because there is a question about that in your, on your dock. Have you the envelope? He asked. I burned it, replied Jekyll. Before I thought about, before I thought what I was about, but it bore no postmark. The note was handed in. Shall I keep this and sleep upon it? Asked Utterson. I wish you to judge for me entirely, was the reply. I have lost confidence in myself. Well, I shall consider, returned the lawyer. And now, one word more. It was Hyde who dictated the terms of your will about that disappearance. The doctor seemed seized with a qualm of faintness. He shut his mouth tight and nodded. I knew it, said Utterson. He meant to murder you. You have had a fine escape. I've had what is far more to the purpose, returned the doctor solemnly. I've had a lesson. Oh, God, Utterson, what a lesson I've had. And he covered his face for a moment with his hands. On his way out, the lawyer stopped and had a word or two with Poole. Poole, you know, is the butler. He's the guy that answers the door for Dr. Jekyll. By the by, said he, there was a letter handed in today. What was the messenger like? But Poole was positive. Nothing had come except by post, and only circulars by that, he added. So nobody delivered that letter. Dr. Jekyll lied, okay? Nobody delivered it hand by hand, like Dr. Jekyll said they did. This news sent off the visitor with his fears renewed. Plainly, the letter had come by the laboratory door, possibly indeed, it had been written in the cabinet, and if that were so, it must be differently judged and handled with more caution. So he's thinking, maybe the letter wasn't delivered at all. Maybe it was written right there in the laboratory. Okay. The newsboys, as he went, were crying themselves hoarse along the footways. Special edition, shocking murder of an MP. That was the funeral oration of one friend and client. And he could not help a certain apprehension, lest the good name of another should be sucked down in the eddy of the scandal. It was, at least, a ticklish decision that he had to make. And self-reliant as he was by habit, he began to cherish a longing for advice. It was not to be had directly, but perhaps he thought it might be fished for. Presently after, he sat on one side of his own hearth with Mr. Guest, his head clerk, upon the other, 
and midway between, at a nicely calculated distance from the fire, a bottle of particular old wine that had long dwelt unsunned in the foundations of the house. The fog still slept on the wing above the drowned city, where the lamps glimmered like carbuncles through the muffle and smother of these fallen clouds. The procession of town's life was still rolling in through the great arteries with a sound as of a mighty wind. But the room was gay with firelight. In the bottle, the acids were long ago resolved. The imperial dye had softened with time as the color grows richer in stained windows and the glow of hot autumn afternoons on hillside vineyards was ready to be set free and to disperse the fogs of London. Insensibly, the lawyer melted. There was no man from whom he kept fewer secrets than Mr. Guest. He was not always sure that he kept as many as he meant. Guest had often been on business by the doctors. He knew Poole. He could scarce have failed to hear of Mr. Hyde's familiarity about the house. He might draw conclusions. Was it not as well, then, that he should see a letter which put that mystery to rights? And above all, since Guest, being a great student and a critic of handwriting, would consider the step natural and obliging? So he's thinking about getting Mr. Guest to compare the handwritings of the letter and with Dr. Jekyll's handwriting. The clerk, besides, was a man of counsel. He would scarce read so strange a document without dropping a remark. And by that remark, Mr. Utterson might shape his future course. This is a sad business about Sir Danvers, he said. Yes, sir, indeed. It has elicited a great deal of public feeling, returned the guest. The man, of course, was mad. I should like to hear your views on that, replied Utterson. I have a document here in his handwriting. It is between ourselves, for I scarce know what to do about it. It is an ugly business at the best. But there it is, quite in your way, a murderer's autograph. Guest's eyes brightened, and he sat down at once and studied it with passion. No, sir, he said, not mad, but it is an odd hand. And by all accounts, a very odd writer, added the lawyer. Just then the servant entered with a note. Is that from Dr. Jekyll, sir? inquired the clerk. I thought I knew the writing. Anything private, Mr. Utterson? Only an invitation to dinner. Why? Do you want to see it? One moment. I thank you, sir. And the clerk laid the two sheets of paper alongside and sedulously compared their contents. Thank you, sir, he said at last, returning both. It is a very interesting autograph. There was a pause during which Mr. Utterson struggled with himself. Why did you compare them, guest? He inquired suddenly. Well, sir. Well, sir, returned the clerk. There's a rather singular resemblance. The two hands are in many points identical, only differently sloped. Rather quaint, said Utterson. It is, as you say, rather quaint, returned Guest. I wouldn't speak of this note, you know, said the master. No, sir, said the clerk. I understand. But no sooner was Mr. Utterson alone that night than he locked the note into his safe where it reposed from that time forward. What, he thought, Henry Jekyll forged for a murderer and his blood ran cold in his veins. So what does he think? He, what do you think? Uh -huh. He thinks Dr. Jekyll's covering for Hyde. Let's keep going. This is a tragic chapter here about Dr. Lane. I don't know if any of you have already read it yet, but I'm going to go ahead and... We don't know. The point was he was just looking at the handwriting how he just explained it. He, he just explains the gist of the letter, and that's what you put in it. Yes. 
Does that make sense? Because we really, he doesn't really tell us literally what was in that letter, but we just give the gist and that answer. Okay, so this is a tragic chapter. So let's see what happens to Dr. Landon. Sean, can we have Brandon Wood check out? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Lucky for Brandon, he already read it, right? Did you read six as well? Uh, oh, no, you guys got past my list. Oh, okay. okay. Well, be sure to read six at home, okay, and do the questions. Time ran on. Thousands of pounds were offered in reward for the death of Sir Danvers was resented as a public injury. But Mr. Hyde had disappeared out of the ken of the police as though he had never existed. Much of his past was unearthed, indeed, and all disreputable. Tales came out of the man's cruelty, at once so callous and violent, of his vile wife, of his strange associates, of the hatred that seemed to have surrounded his career. But of his present whereabouts, not a whisper. From the time he had left the house in Soho on the morning of the murder, he was simply blotted out. And gradually, as time drew on, Mr. Utterson began to recover from the hotness of his alarm and to grow more at quiet with himself. Because as time went by and Hyde was gone, Utterson started you know, feeling better because Hyde was not around anymore. I'm looking for where I left off. Okay. All right. <laughs> From the time he left the house in Soho to the morning of the murder, he was simply blotted out, and gradually, as time drew on, Utterson began to recover from the hotness of his alarm and to grow more at quiet with himself. Sorry, I repeated that. The death of Sir Danvers was, to his way of thinking, more than paid for by the disappearance of Mr. Hyde. Now that that evil influence had been withdrawn, a new life began for Dr. Jekyll. He came out of his seclusion. He renewed relations with his friends. He became once more their familiar guest and entertainer. And whilst he always had been known for charities, he was now no less distinguished for religion. He was busy. He was much in the open air. He did good. His face seemed to open and brighten as if with an inward consciousness of service. And for more than two months, the doctor was at peace. On the 8th of January, Utterson had dined at the doctor's with a small party. Lanyon had been there, and the face of the host had looked from one to the other as in the old days when the trio were inseparable friends. On the 12th, and again on the 14th, the door was shut against the lawyer. The doctor was confined to the house, Cool said, and saw no one. On the 15th, he tried again and was again refused. And having now been used to the last two months of seeing his friend almost daily, he found this return of solitude to weigh heavy on his spirits. The fifth night he had in guest, he had in guest to dine with him, and the sixth he betook himself to Dr. Lanyon's, because at this point Dr. Jekyll was refusing to see anybody. Okay, there at least he was not denied admittance, but when he came in, he was shocked at the change which had taken place in Dr. Lanyon's appearance. He had his death warrant written legibly upon his face. The rosy man had grown pale. His flesh had fallen away. He was visibly balder and older, and yet it was not so much these tokens of a swift physical decay that arrested the daughter lawyer's notice as a look in the eye and quality of manner that seemed to testify to some deep-seated terror of the mind. It was unlikely that the doctor should fear death, and yet that was what Utterson was tempted to suspect. Yes, he thought, he is a doctor. He must know his own state and that his days are counted. 
and the knowledge is more than he can bear. And yet, when Utterson remarked on his ill looks, it was with an air of greatness that Langdon declared himself a doomed man. I've had a shock, he said, and I shall never recover. It is a question of weeks. Well, life has been pleasant. I liked it. Yes, sir, I used to like it. And sometimes think if we knew all, we should be more glad to get away. Jekyll is ill too, said Utterson. Have you seen him? But Lanyon's face changed and he held up a trembling hand. I wish to see or hear no more of Dr. Jekyll, he said in a loud and steady voice. I'm quite done with that person and I beg that you will spare me any allusion to one whom I regard as dead. Tut, tut, said Mr. Utterson. And then after a considerable pause, can't I do anything, he inquired. We are three very old friends, Lanyon. We shall not live to make others. Nothing can be done, returned Lanyon. Ask himself. He will not see me, said the lawyer. I am not surprised at that, was the reply. Someday, Utterson, after I'm dead, you may perhaps come to learn the right and the wrong of this. I cannot tell you. And in the meantime, if you can sit and talk with me of other things, for God's sake, stay and do so. But if you cannot keep clear of this accursed topic, then in God's name go, for I cannot bear it. As soon as he got home, Utterson sat down and wrote to Jekyll, complaining of his exclusion from the house and asking the cause of this unhappy break with Lanyon, and the next day brought him a long answer, often very pathetically worded and sometimes darkly mysterious in drift. This is a letter that he received from Jekyll. The quarrel with Landon was incurable, and it says, I do not blame our old friend, Jekyll wrote, but I share his view that we must never meet, I mean, from henceforth, to lead a life of extreme seclusion. You must not be surprised, nor must you doubt my friendship. If my door is often shut even to you, you must suffer me to go my own dark way. I have brought on myself a punishment and a danger that I cannot name. Does anybody know? Do you think, have you figured out what's going on yet? He goes on to write, if I am the chief of sinners, I am the chief of sufferers also. I could not think that this earth contained a place for sufferings and terrors so unmanning. And you can do but one thing, Utterson, to lighten this destiny. And that is to respect my silence. Utterson was amazed. The dark influence of Hyde had been withdrawn, and the doctor returned to his old tasks and amities. A week ago, the prospect had smiled with every promise of a cheerful and honored age. And now, in a moment, friendship and peace of mind and the whole tenor of his life were wrecked. So great and unprepared a change pointed to madness. But in view of Lanyon's manner and words, there must lie for it some deeper ground. A week afterwards, Dr. Lanyon took to his bed, and in something less than a fortnight, he was dead. The night after the funeral, at which he had been sadly affected, Utterson locked the door of his business room and sitting there by the light of a melancholy candle, drew out and set forth before him an envelope addressed by the hand and sealed with the seal of his dead friend, private, for the hands of G.J. Utterson alone and in case of his predecease to be destroyed unread. That means that the letter is not supposed to be opened, okay? So, it was emphatically superscribed. The lawyer dreaded to behold the contents. I've buried one friend today, he thought. What if this 
should cost me another. And then he condemned the fear as disloyalty and broke the seal. Within there was another enclosure, likewise sealed and marked upon the cover as not to be opened until the death or disappearance of Dr. Henry Jekyll. Utterson could not trust his eyes. Yes, it was disappearance here again, as in the mad will which he had long ago restored to its author. Here again were the idea of a disappearance and the name of Henry Jekyll bracketed. Where am I? I turned around and got lost. Okay. Okay, but in the will, that idea had sprung from the sinister suggestion of the man Hyde. It was set there with a purpose, all too plain and horrible. Written by the hand of Landon, what should it mean? A great curiosity came on the trustee to disregard the prohibition and dive at once to the bottom of these mysteries. But professional honor and faith to his dead friend were stringent obligations, and the packet slept in the inmost corner of his private safe, he decided not to open it. It is one thing to mortify curiosity, another to conquer it. And it may be doubted if from that day forth, Utterson desired the society of his surviving friend with the same eagerness. He thought of him kindly, but his thoughts were disquieted and fearful he went to call, indeed, but he was perhaps relieved to be denied admittance. Because even though he wanted to go visit, he kind of didn't want to. He kind of didn't want to even go there. Perhaps in his heart, he preferred to speak with Poole upon the doorstep, and surrounded by the air and the sounds of the open city, rather than to be admitted into that house of voluntary bondage and to sit and speak with its inscrutable recluse. Who is the inscrutable recluse? Who, who is the recluse here? Dr. Jekyll. Yes, Dr. Jekyll. Good. And that, guys, is a metaphor, okay? You're calling Dr. Jekyll an inscrutable recluse. Poole had indeed no very pleasant news to communicate. The doctor, it appeared, now more than ever, confined himself to the cabinet over the laboratory, where he would sometimes even sleep. He was out of spirits. He had grown very silent. He did not read. It seemed as if he had something on his mind. Utterson became so used to the unvarying character of these reports that he fell off little by little in the frequency of his visits. So... He, he stopped even going back to the main house. He started just living in that dirty, nasty laboratory. And he, he just stopped. It's, it's like he's fallen into this deep depression or something. And we don't know why. Because a few weeks ago, he was his old self. And then all of a sudden, He's confining himself to the laboratory and refusing to see anybody. 